we're going to do just a little bit of a recap uh, from the last few weeks. And uh, just because not all, all of us have been here, uh, but it's important that we begin to, to paint a picture uh, of what we're going to build on tonight. And so um, the first, first week that we came back from the new year, uh, and once again, I believe that every one of us, uh, we cannot settle for the same relationship with Jesus that we had in 2019, or you will get overwhelmed, right? Because it's not enough. It is something that has to continue to grow, just like any other relationship. It has to grow. It has to deepen. You have to rely on it more and more. And so uh, we talked about promises. And the thing about God's promises is we can get selfish. This is the time that we can get selfish uh, in our walk with Christ. You want to know why? Because God's promise for me is going to be different than His promise. It's going to look different than it does in your life. Now, when I was in school, I thought that uh, good things were only happening uh, to those who had really, really incredible athletic abilities or just super good grades. And I was honestly neither one of those guys, right? And so oftentimes we feel like we blend in or worse yet, we get overlooked at opportunities, right? Here's the deal. God's, God's promise is for you because He actually created you, right? I want you just to think about that for a minute. And so it doesn't matter if right now you've got a D that looks really like an F in biology. Guess what? It doesn't affect God's promise for you. Some of you guys, you're going to be right there in summer school. Guess what? God's promise is not affected by summer school. And so it's for the overachiever. It's for the underachiever. But it's for every one of us. And so we talked about His promise. The next week, we talked about you've got to answer a question. You've got to know who is Jesus Christ to you. Hope you guys remember that. You've got to know who He is to you. And not what somebody else thinks He is, it's who He is to you. And then this last week, we talked about obedience, right? See, I slipped that in? Obedience. Because I want to make a statement. I want to be very, very clear. You can miss out on God's promise. Does, does everybody understand that? That is a bold statement. Although you have a promise spoken into your life, and there is a plan for your life, you can also miss out on it. Because obedience brings forth God's blessing. It fulfills God's promise. And I want to paint you a picture. If uh, uh, How many of you guys use, uh, a, lot of, well, a lot of you are drivers now. How many of you guys use uh, Google Maps on your phone, right? You, you did what? You had to use it today. Okay. A lot of us have lost our ability to read a road map because we rely on, I know not you, we rely on Google, right? And so we'll put in, a, we'll just, we, you don't even have to type it in. You just, you just talk into this device. Awesome. And so what happens if you, if you miss a turn or direction? You do not end up in the same place, right? Now, now God's, God's promise for you is, is kind of like that and kind of not like that. Like, if you continue to go your own way when the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, I'm needing you to veer this way, this is where you're, you're headed, your direction, right? You're going to end up in two different places. And so obedience brings forth God's blessing. It, it, it is what the fulfillment of God's promise is. Because guess what? He wants to lead you to a place uh, of contentment, of being satisfied. When's the last time... That you have just sat down after school, after a long day, and you've got ready to pray, or you've got you just had this thought, and you're like, right now in this moment, I am perfectly satisfied with who God has made me. Right? Now, for some of us, that's a thought that you have never had before. And I understand that. But you know what? That's what his promise is for me. When he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, at some point that begins to resonate, and I get to this place where I'm just like. I don't have to pretend to be anybody else. As a matter of fact, I don't want to be anybody else. Because God has made me, and He has declared that this is the life that He has prepared for me. And I'm going to rest in His promise. I'm going to rest in it. And so, it's with that thought that we're going to pick up the rest of the story. Because there's always more to our story. Amen? Amen. Uh, we, we can talk about God's promise, and we can talk about the good things that He has. We can talk about obedience, right? Right? But there's always more to the story. 
You may left this place last Wednesday night, had a touch from God right here at this altar, went back to your school, went back to your house that night, and somebody said something a little sideways to you, right? And it brought you right back full circle to the place that you started from. And then you thought, oh, did I really get a touch from God? That's what we're going to talk about. The rest of the story, it's important. And so, we have been talking from uh, Genesis chapter 16, chapter 17, talking about a young woman named Hagar, a young woman named Sarah, and a, young, a, a man named Abraham. By the way, Abraham and Sarah were not young. I take that back. And so, if I can, can I read you what the Word says, and then we are going to get right into it. Because where we ended up with, God spoke a promise in Hagar's life, but then he also said, now I want you to turn around and be obedient in the family, in the community that you just left. And oh, by the way, they're probably not going to receive you with open arms. Does anybody wake up in a house where uh, you're not received with open arms? Do you ever go to school where, where the red carpet is not rolled out before you when you get off the bus or get out of your car? Uh, the, the paparazzi's not there taking pictures. Oh, look who's here, look who's here. No, 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 no. No, we walk into hostile situations. Amen? Is, is that real life? We walk into conflict, right? We walk and try to avoid it, but we walk into drama. Amen? Amen. This, is, this, is, this is the life we live. So when Jesus said, uh, when God said, Hagar, I'm going to bless this child that is in your belly right now, and he will be born, he will be healthy, and I will give you many descendants. That is, that's an incredible promise. But then he said, oh, by the way, I want you to be obedient, and I want you to turn around, and I want you to go right back into that community that you fled from, the one that they pushed you out of. Does that sound like high school? <laughs> does, that, does, that, I mean, does that sound like middle school? This is a hostile environment. This is what it says. When Isaac grew up and was about to be weaned, Abraham prepared a huge feast to celebrate the occasion. Sarah saw Ishmael, the son of Abraham, and her Egyptian servant named Hagar, making fun of her son Isaac. So he turned and, and told, she told, turned and told Abraham, get rid of her. Does this sound familiar? Almost exactly what happened before, right? Have you ever noticed that life is a, a little bit more like a roller coaster than it is smooth sailing? I've returned back to the emotion that I thought I had put in my rearview mirror. I thought I had put distance between me and anger. I thought I had put I thought I had put distance between me and hurt, me and depression. All of a sudden I find myself back in the same situation. This is where I was, right? 14 years, if my math is right. 14 years had passed since uh, Sarah forced her out of the community, the family, right? And now she's saying the same thing. Now, can we look at something real quick? Because Scripture doesn't show this, but I have a pretty good idea that when, uh, that when Hagar returned, that there was a lot of really bad looks. How many of you know that you can say a lot with your eyes that you don't have to say with your mouth and get your point across? Right? I was thinking about that today. Have you ever got, had somebody mean mug you? Do you know that term, I'm going to mean mug you? That means I'm going to give you a look that says, if I could kill you with my look, you would be dead right now. Right? I can almost guarantee you that day after day when this woman was a part of this community, that people were giving her bad looks. They were saying words they shouldn't have said to her. When she was going out doing her job, doing her duty, doing her work, they were making fun or they were saying something to dis discredit who she was. And the whole time, she's got God's promise on her. Does this make sense? Is this not where many of us are right now in this moment? Why? Because right now, the majority of the people in this room are under the guardianship of someone else. Why? Because quite frankly, you guys aren't bringing home the bacon and you shouldn't because you're not at that season of life. You can't provide a, a, a roof over your head. You can't do it. You, you can't provide clothing. You, 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 can't, um, you can't acquire the necessity that makes you an adult. There's a few things that makes you an adult. That's one, that's, that's being able to provide for yourself. That's being able to, to mature spiritually. So in this season of life, you're very much in a season like Hagar was. Because there is always somebody to rule and reign over your decisions. Now guess what? That does not change the promise that God has spoke into your life. Why? Because where you're at right now is not a permanent situation. It is 
temporary. Hagar's life was 14 years temporary. Think about that. I want you to go in with the mentality is I'm going to school today knowing that at the most my high school career can last is four years. At the most. If you fail, it can be longer, but just go with me, right? This is a temporary situation. I have the promise of God upon me, but the promise may not be fulfilled until His time. So in that, in that phase, in that season, I am demonstrating obedience to what God has asked me to do. He has asked me to be faithful. He has asked me uh, to respect those in authority over me. He has asked me to deepen my relationship with Him. This is where I begin to prepare for the season of life where I walk into His blessing, into His promise. Because right now, if you receive God's promise or you receive His blessing, you will not be ready. Many of you guys are, are praying this prayer. Uh, and I know Aubrey's praying it. She told me this earlier. She was like, no, nah, she didn't say that. I, I'm going to quit picking on it. Here's the deal. We're praying this prayer. We're saying, hey, God, can you, can you send me this person to, to complete me, to fulfill me? Can you send me this person? You ain't praying that, are you? She said, no. She said, I ain't praying that. I don't want nobody. But some of us are. And if God gives you that person right now in the season that you are at right now, you're going to mess it up because you're not ready. Does that make sense? Obedience becomes before blessing. So here we go. We're going to continue to read. Abraham was upset. Shouldn't have slept with him. Abraham was very much because Ishmael was his son. But God told Abraham, uh, do not be upset over the boy and your servant. Do whatever Sarah tells you. That's interesting to me. Abraham is getting ready to send, uh, this is actually his wife at this point, one of them, send her away. And she has a young boy, he's about 14 years old, he's a young man, and, and he's getting ready to send her away. And, and God speaks to him and he says, hey, don't worry, your time is done. Now it is my time to fulfill what it is that I said. Some of us are at a season in life where our time of favor and our time of blessing hasn't been there. It's our time for obedience. The Word of God says faith without action. It's, it's meaningless. It's worthless. It doesn't measure up. So you can have all the faith in the world, but if it doesn't turn into action like obedience or like love or, or like dedication or, or like, like, like service, like if it doesn't show up externally in your life, what is internally going on, guess what? It's worthless. And that's, that's something that's this is about to, there's about to be a demonstration here because she's been obedient for 14 years. And to end up back in the same place, it doesn't make sense. And so it says this, So Abraham got up early the next morning and prepared food in a container of water and strapped them on Hagar's shoulders. Then he sent her away with her son and she wandered aimlessly in the desert or in the wilderness of Bersheba. You guys, uh, you guys ever feel like you're alone? Does, it, does anybody feel like you're the only person that is going through this situation? You're the only person that this has ever happened to, right? The interesting part about it, in a room this size with this many students is you guys' story and what you're going through will be very different, but the emotions and some of the situations will be very similar because we all feel like we're going through things alone. And you know what I've learned is a lot of us feel like there is no one that believes that we can do better. Some of us come from a home where we assume by generational things that we will become who our parents are. Or we will become what it is that we see in our home. Guess what? God's promise for your life stamps that out and says you will not settle for mediocrity. Is that uplifting to anybody? Is that encouraging? That says I will overcome what so and so did not. Because God's promise is spoken to my life. And here's the deal. You can say, well, I don't think that, that, that God understands. I don't think that Jesus understands. Can I, can I read you something real quick? Because I think this is worth taking the time. I wasn't going to read this. Um, and so this may take just a second. But we are going to, we're going to find this. That didn't take long. This is in John 7. <laughs> Aubrey, this is where it's coming from. John 7 verse 1. It says, after this, Jesus traveled around Galilee. He wanted to stay out of Judea where the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. Oh, I want to stop there for a minute. Do you think that Jesus understands pressure? 
It says this, but soon it was time for the Jewish festival of shelters. And Jesus' brothers said to him, did, did you pick that up? He's not going back to Judea because they are plotting his death. Okay, I want you to understand that first and foremost. And then it says, Jesus' brothers said to him, this is in the same paragraph, leave here and go to Judea where your followers can see your miracles. You can't become famous if you hide like this. If you can do so many wonderful things, show yourself to the world. And it says this, for even his brothers didn't believe in him. Anybody come from a house where they don't believe in you? Anybody walk the hallways of school where they don't believe in you? Anybody come from a family where they were like, you're never going to accomplish anything? And they speak these lies into your life over and over. I see many, many hands over and over again. God is saying, listen very closely. It doesn't matter what they say because the creator of the universe has final say and authority in your life. And the situation that you are in right now is not permanent. And the outcome of your life is not going to look like, and it doesn't have to look like, your parents, family members, or guardians. It is temporary. This is walking in obedience. And it says this. She finds herself in a, in a wilderness outside of, of Beersheba, where once again she finds herself in a dry place. Her water was gone that Abraham gave her. Thanks for the water. It's gone. She put the boy in the shade of a bush. Then she went and sat down by herself about a hundred yards away. That's, that's a football field away. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said, as she burst into tears. I want to paint a picture real quick. The first time that we see Hagar, she was in the desert. She was pregnant. She was hopeless. She was helpless. She had no provisions. She had no water. Fourteen years later, she's in the desert again. Can I be honest with you? Life looks a whole lot more like living in the land of conflict with God's promise on you than it looks like tiptoeing through the promised land. Amen? Can we be real, real honest? I'm not saying that every day and every year is a struggle. I'm saying that that is very much a part of this life. Because guess what? This life is not as good as it gets by far. Because God's kingdom has not come. That's why we're praying for His kingdom to come. On earth as it is in heaven. I'm going to continue on. It says this. But God heard the boy crying. It's important that, that Hagar, she says this in the Bible. She says, I don't, want, I don't want to watch the boy die. She had already previously been given a promise. Now here's the part where we get real personal. Everyone in this room has had a promise spoken into their life. The struggle is not speaking death into that promise. Not speaking death into the promise. If God has told you that you are going to be someone who reaches others, someone who loves others, someone who does incredible things for the kingdom of God, He will accomplish what He has set out in you if you remain obedient. That's a fact. There is nothing that can disrupt God's promise in your life. Okay? He has final say. I, one time I had this tree in the back, and it was, a, it was an oak tree, and it was beautiful. It was the only shade tree I had in my whole house, in, in, in that whole property. It, it, wasn't even, it wasn't even an acre. It was like a, it was a lot, whatever that is, half an acre. There was one tree that provided shade, right? Just one. I started knowing that the tree was dying. Three, four years later, the tree was dead. I had an arborist come out, a professional tree cutter, someone that should have known, someone that appeared to be wiser. He said, Matthew, we've got to cut this thing down. It's dead. It's diseased. It is never going to grow again. I said, well, I'll give it another year. I gave it another year. It's still dead, right? The following year, guess what? There was something that sprouted from what appeared dead, and it was a little shoot, a little branch. The next year, the branch grew larger and got bigger. Shade was beginning to return. Why? Because I didn't cut the tree down because it wasn't dead. Even though somebody spoke death into my life. Some of you guys, are you're at, a, you're at a great obstacle. And if I'm being honest, an obstacle that I did not inherit in my life. I had a mom and dad who did not speak death over me. 
They did not declare that I would not accomplish what it was that I wanted to. Matter of fact, I had a mom that was like so many of the other moms, like in American Idol. My mom should have told me, Matthew, you can't sing. You know what I'm saying? There were certain things in my life. She said, she said, boy, I love you, and you're my only son, but you're not that good at that, right? Like, like she was overboard. She was extra. She was like, no, you're amazing at this. But I really wasn't. That, that's, not the, that's not truth for many of us in this place tonight, and I understand that. And I understand that as a parent, our mistakes and the lives that we live and, and the mistakes that if not, if we did not quite measure up to the expectation we put up on ourselves, we will transcend and we will speak that into our children. I can say that because I am a parent. And many of you guys are living in homes where they have spoke things into you and they have spoke things over you that quite frankly are a lie. And we call things inaccurate, we call them lies. Because they're not true. And just like that oak tree, your promise isn't dead and it's not dying. Just like that oak tree, you better guard it, you better protect it, and you better be obedient to God's calling because it's just going to sprout at the right time and it's going to provide a shade, it's going to provide comfort, it's going to provide a blessing. So the story continues and God always hears. It says this, God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven. The part that I don't understand about this and the part that is true in life, why did, why did God rescue her uh, before she left? Have you ever thought about that? Why didn't God come down and rescue Hagar before she went out to the wilderness, before she set her only child right here, and then she walked a football's length away because she couldn't stand to see him die? Why didn't he rescue her then? I, I, I don't know. Oftentimes when I pray, and, and you guys pray, you probably want something to happen instantly. Don't we all? Oftentimes it doesn't happen that way. But God shows up at the exact time because He knew what was going to happen. And it says, He heard the baby crying. He heard the child crying. God hears it when you're... He hears our tears. Did you know that? Just because your promise has not been revealed doesn't mean that He doesn't hear you. And that's powerful if you stake claim to the fact that He is going to move. Obedience isn't only acting when you know He's going to move. Obedience is acting when you know He may not move for a while. Amen? He's saying, I hear you. That's for somebody tonight. I don't know who that's for. You've been, you've been crying. You've been doing something. And God's saying, no, 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 my child. I hear you. And I will move when the time is right. And it says this. It says, Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying and he li as he lies there. He says, go to him and comfort him, for I will make him a great nation from his descendants. I don't, I don't know if you guys remember that passage of Scripture. That's exactly what he spoke into her life 14 years before. Cassie, how old are you? 16. Cassie, you could be 30 years old if it, if it measures up to something like this. You could be 30 years old when God fulfills the promise in your life. Are you willing to wait for His best? Hey, Matthew, could I add something to your whole thing? Sure. Okay, so like for my home, I wasn't like Matthew. I didn't have the things he's talking about this great family. You know, uh, I had parents that spoke death into my life. I didn't think it was under No, 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 no. no. Yeah, it, so I had a mother that said that I was going to be like my my father. I was in a broken home. My parents were drug addicts. And, you know, it was real tough. So each time I turned around, it was like, you're never going to amount to anything. I was 30 years old when I gave my life to the Lord. And I was nothing, okay? I was a six-time felon. I was a 15-year meth addict. So everything that my father was, I was. But I never knew my real dad. I never knew who he was at all. I had a stepdad that at times told me he didn't like me. So there come this spot for me, I didn't know who God was. Because I'm thinking of a father figure, like this father. And it's like, I can't, I can't relate to this. But I got to a spot of being so sick and tired of being sick and tired and hurting so deep. And I know some of you guys hurt. But it's this. It's the hope and the peace that comes from what he's talking about. She thought that her baby was going to die in this desert, you know what I'm saying? And the only hope that she was is crying out to God. That was the only hope I had. I've done been down the hardest road you could think about going down, and I hope none of you guys get to go down it. And I know some of you are going down it. But the thing is, is 
I was 30 years old, and I'm at a spot like, if you're real, I need you right now. I was so desperate because I hurt so bad. If you're real, here, I need you. And I know you guys are at this desperation spot, some of you. So I pray today you don't leave here the same. Yeah, Amen. Let me ask you, 30 years old, right? 30 years old. So he could have very well been 16 when that promise was spoken into him. I was actually in church at 16. 16. Mm. So I, I'd like to close with this because what I want to do tonight is, and I appreciate that word, what I want to do tonight is I want to prepare an opportunity. Because it's, it's a setting like what we have tonight is the, the reality. We really do have to be obedient and go back to the same home that we came from. There, there, there's not an option at this point. We really do have to be obedient and walk the halls of our same high school and middle school. That, that's inevitable. That, that will take place tomorrow. So the only thing that we can do is capture a glimpse of God's promise. Capture a glimpse of who a true father is if you don't have a recollection of it. It's him. There is no earthly father that I could compare to who my heavenly father is. I don't need to. Some of you guys are, 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 have very similar stories that Josh has. I, it doesn't even make sense when my dad is, but it's in these moments tonight when we press in a little bit deeper that he reveals himself to you so much stronger. And it says this. We're going to close. God opened Hagar's eyes. There's some eyes in here that need to be opened by revelation of Jesus Christ. And she saw a well full of water. She quickly filled her water container and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy as he grew up in the wilderness. And he became a skillful archer. I love how the Bible's manly. I mean, that's, that's it. And he settled in the wilderness of Paran. I want you to listen to that word. He settled in the wilderness. His mother arranged for him to marry a woman from the land of Egypt. Listen to that. He, he never left the wilderness. Do you, guys, you, you guys are capturing that, right? His life prospered even though he didn't, leave the, he didn't leave the location that he was placed in. His life fulfilled God's promise even though he didn't hover and take a helicopter ride and go to a different part of the country. See, that's what we want to do, but that's not how God acts. God is willing to do something internally in your life today without changing locations, without changing families without changing high schools. He wants to begin to do something. Why? Because you're no longer walking into your house and walking into the hallways of your school the same way. No. Because God is doing and stirring something. And He is changing who we are from the inside. And it will be seen externally, but not right away. That's the reality. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you'll stand up just for a moment, we have got 15 minutes left. And then it's over. And I'm not an emotionally hyping kind of a person because uh, chances are the emotions are going to leave as soon as you leave the door. And it doesn't work. I am trusting that the Holy Spirit is going to do His work. 